Hi. <clears throat> this unit is basically cleaning up some odds and ends from the last unit. We're going to talk about uh, a modification of L2 regularization. We're going to talk about L1 regularization and sparsity. And then probably most importantly, we're going to talk about ensembles, um, which probably have the most um, significance for practice. Um, OK, so the first thing I want to talk about is the modification to um, shrinkage. L2 regularization. Um, and basically, I want to think of the relationship between L2 regularization and early stopping. So in early stopping, we start at some initial parameter vector, and we do a bunch of updates, and then we stop at some point. And limiting the number of updates from the initialization can be viewed as limiting the, diff the distance travel in parameter space from the initialization. And uh, there's various reasons to think that a more appropriate prior probability in L2 regularization is instead of taking the norm of the weight vector, take the norm of the weight of the vector from the initialization to the final vector. Take the norm of the vector that's the difference, the, the travel vector between the initialization and the final vector. So this is the, the, the vector, the, the motions you've made in parameter space. And we're going to take the prior to be proportional to the square of the motion in parameter space. Um, and that it, this is straightforward, right? It's just our, our update equation is going to be shrinkage toward the initialization. And there's some experimental evidence to suggest that this is a better, um, a better prior. And we're, we'll come back to this later in the course. It's just worth pointing out when you do L2 regularization that this is probably a better choice. Okay, the second sort of odd um, loose end is L1 regularization. So in L1 regularization, we replace the prior, we're still working with the prior probability, and we replace that prior with this um, Poisson prior, where um, the prior probability is e to the minus of parameter lambda times the one norm of the vector. So it's called L1 regularization because this is the L1 norm rather than the L2 norm. Um, <clears throat> and the L1 norm is just the sum over the parameter values of the absolute value of that parameter. And we can do this exact same analysis for this prior that we did for the L2 prior. And uh, the uh, derivation of this equation is exactly the same as it was for L2. We want the parameter that maximizes the product of the prior probability over the parameter space and the product over our training points of the probability of y given x. And, and that's exactly the same as it was before. Um, we derived this before. So um, if I take the, the argmax of this is the same as the argmax of the log of that, which is the same as the argmin of the negative log, and the products become sums, so we're taking the arg min of um, the sum of minus log the probability of y given x plus minus log this. Um, the normalization constant doesn't affect, is, is insensitive to phi. So that goes, that can be ignored in the optimization. And we get this, this expression. Um, this log, the log of this prior has turned into this. So now we want to minimize the cross entropy loss, standard cross entropy. Oh, from here to here, we're dividing by n. So we take this equation and divide by n. And when we divide by n, we get an average cross entropy loss. And that's the way we've been formulating cross entropy loss in terms of an average cross entropy loss. So this get, becomes the standard average cross, this becomes the standard cross entropy loss. An average log loss is the cross entropy loss. Um, and note that because we divided by n from here to here, this we get a division by n in this um, coefficient. So um, this is just worth noting that um, our update equation now uh, corresponds to taking the gradient of this total objective. The gradient of this part is just the gradient of the log loss. That's the gradient that we had before. Um, and the gradient of this um, depends on the sign of the parameter. So we're now going to look at the gradient for each parameter. And if this, if the parameter is positive, the, the loss is getting larger as we move away from zero. So the negative direction of the gradient is back towards zero. 
So the negative, the negative prior um, log probability is, is um, we're doing a minus equal. So this term is shrinking us back towards zero. If the number's positive, we're being pushed towards zero. If the number's negative, we're also being pushed towards zero. So this is pushing us towards zero um, in both cases. And we've already noted that the learning rate can be made robust to changes in momentum and batch by using this equation for the learning rate where that's an, a, a robust temperature parameter. Okay, so we've got this, this is our update equation, our SGG update equation with an L1 prior. Now an L1 prior is closely related to sparsity. So sparsity means that many of your parameters are zero and that you have only a few non-zero parameters. So the optimum, the optimum parameter setting is one where the gradient of the total loss is zero. So <clears throat> this is, this is the, the um, update equation. This is the gradient of the loss for a particular training example. Um, uh, this is the ith component of that gradient for parameter i. So we're going to be looking at parameter i. Um, and uh, the optimum parameter is going to have be the, the case where the average of this is zero. So the average of this is just the, the, the true gradient, the ith component of the true gradient. Um, now, uh, this is going to be very sensitive to the sign of this. So if the sign of this is positive, we get this coefficient. If the sign of this is negative, we get negative this coefficient. Now, if this gradient, the average gradient here, is less than this coefficient, then it's overcome by this coefficient. And this coefficient will, in this prior term, will drive it down towards zero until it gets to zero. And when it gets to zero, if it goes past zero, this flips sign and pushes it back towards zero. And if this gradient is less than this coefficient at zero, um, then it doesn't move, right? It gets stuck at zero. This overcomes this term and it gets driven to zero. And that's what's making it sparse. So the ith parameter is going to be zero if the norm of, if the norm of the gradient at zero is less than this coefficient, then the gradient can't overcome the thing that's driving it to zero, and, it, and that's why we get sparsity. Um, <clears throat> if the gradient is strong enough to overcome this, then for the gradient to be zero, these two terms in the gradient must exactly balance, and we get that the ith gradient um, uh, is exactly this coefficient, and, and the sign of, this, this can be either positive or negative. Um, and that'll push it either in a positive or negative direction. So the sign gets involved. Um, ensembles. Okay, so this is probably the most significant part of this unit. So what is an ensemble? An ensemble is when you build a sequence of models, a bunch of models. And uh, remember what the, what the model is defining is a probability of y given x. So what we're gonna do is take a bunch of models and combine them such that the ensemble probability of y given x is just the average probability that each individual model assigns, which is take the, the average of the probabilities that the model assigns. And so the ensemble probability can be written as an expectation over a uniform distribution over the models of the probability that that model assigns. And ensemble models almost always in all domains, all applications, they'll do better than an individual model. So if you're in a bake-off, if you're in a you know, leaderboard, people will often say, well, we couldn't train an ensemble be because we don't have enough computational resources. But our one model that we could train does better than anybody else's single model, even though somebody else has had the resources to build an ensemble model, and the ensemble model always does better. So whether or not you're ensembling it can be taken into account in leaderboards. Um, or sometimes is taken into account and in comparing one algorithm to another algorithm. So why is it that the ensemble works better? Um, so you can give a kind of rationalization in terms of Jensen's inequality. So the loss of the ensemble, the, the log loss of the ensemble is an expectation over XY pairs drawn from the population 
of minus log the probability. This is the standard cross entropy objective. But note now that this probability is an average, right? It's an expectation, an average. And by Jensen's inequality, um, the, the negative log is a convex function. And the negative log of the average is less than the average of the negative log for a convex function. So, um, so we get this inequality. When I, when I pull that expectation out, it goes up. Um, so what, and, and now this is, I can take this expectation and pull it out to the front. And so the loss of the ensemble model is, is guaranteed to be less than or equal to the average over the models of the loss of that model. But, but this inequality is a little bit misleading. The, the situation is actually stronger than that, right? What you want to realize is that for any particular XY pair, for each XY pair individually, um, uh, the ensemble loss on that XY pair is less than or equal to the average over the models of the loss um, of the model on that XY pair. So this inequality is applying at each XY pair independently. And that's a stronger observation than just, say, than just comparing the total average over, the, um, over all the XY pairs. Um, and and this, this is at least uh, some rationalization of why the ensembles are doing better. They're doing better on every XY pair than um, the average of the models that they're being built from. Okay, now we're gonna move on to uh, general, real generalization theory. Um, thanks. <laughs>